Welcome back, everybody, to the Talking Sportsbooks podcast. And in this edition, I'm joined by the doyen of sports journalist, Michael Calvin, whose 40-plus year career has seen him traverse the globe reporting on every major sporting event on the calendar. As an acclaimed author as well, he's the first writer to win the Sports Book of the Year prize in successive years. Now, his new book, Whose Game Is It Anyway?, is out now, and he joins me to talk about the experiences accrued over the last 40 years. Now, just a reminder, if you haven't tuned in lately, then all of the previous editions of the podcast are available for download or stream via the website at www.talkingsportsbooks.com or via any of the major streaming providers, including iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, Google and Stitcher. And so then on to today's programme where I'm joined by Michael Calvin as we talked about his new book, Whose game is it anyway? A really a thoroughly enjoyable book, this, which, as you say, part memoir, part manifesto. And we begin with uh, the toolbox, the photograph of your grandfather, your great-grandfather, his death due to COVID in a care home, and you falling very much out of love with football. Now, was this a, a product of the time that we were in a, a, over the last year or was it something you've been planning before that? No, I, I think, to be honest, the book was a product of its time in as much as it was written during the, the, the height of the pandemic. Um, but it was a response to a creeping alienation from the game that, you know, quite frankly, has been part of my life personally and professionally uh, and has enriched me emotionally all throughout my life. Um, I suppose over the last 15 months or so we've all almost been united in a, in a form of, of self-reflection haven't we? It's, it's the sort of life event or generational event that I think has prompted a lot of people to almost search quietly for a bit of meaning. And I suppose I wasn't any different to that. Um, I was very, very struck by uh, the reminders of football as it could be um, in the final days of my father-in-law's life. Uh, you mentioned to him the, the wooden box we found after we passed away, but he was, he was in a care home in Devon and was suffering from uh, an accelerated form of vascular dementia. So the curtains were, were being closed um, across his mind to a degree. About three or four days before he passed, my wife, you know, pretty much apropos nothing. We, we, you know, obviously we couldn't visit him in person, so we were FaceTiming him. And it was, it was a, I think, a unique form of, of, of torture in many ways for not, not just us, but countless thousands of families. Um, and my wife asked him about his childhood memories of football and, and, he had this sudden burst of clarity about being a 11 year old boy walking through the streets of West Watford Terrace streets on, on a Saturday with his dad. And Saturday for him meant the treat at the sweet shop just outside Vicarage road, going into the ground, which is an old gravel pit, this sort of bowl, the people, the noise, the color, the smell, and also the game. And the game sustained him. He was a Watford fan all his life. Um, and uh, he had that sort of, um, I suppose, ability to laugh at himself because sometimes, um, you know, when you support a club like Watford, you're not actually, you know, certainly you're not supporting the brand, certainly when he was growing up. So it was a, it was, football was, it came across to me anyway, uh, as an extension of, you know, key values and, and key assets, i.e. identity and family. And I'd lost that. I'd lost that human connection, if you like, or the game had lost that human connection. Uh, because, you know, as we know, it's hyper-commercialised, it's innately cynical, it's frankly all about the money. And I wanted 
from that moment on to almost try and retrace my steps you know throughout my life i'm you know, really i've been blessed you know council mm -hmm. house kids from watford um worked in more more than 80 countries so the game or sport in general has really enriched my life your your story actually began in hospital as well with you yeah. suffering from tuberculosis what was extraordinary when you read this now is how it was dealt with you were in Harefield hospital you were there for three months not allowed visitors uh, mm -hmm. bar the once a week visit from your your dad it seems almost uh, prehistoric uh, now <laughs> how did you feel being told back then in the height of your teen years that you were going to be literally in quarantine for three months it was sort of Dickensian in my I, I, I was reading quite a lot of Dickens at that time and uh, I suppose you know I was only um, what, 16 17 uh, 16 at the time and uh, I loved his reportage and you know I've, I've grown to I like that type of writing so you know I love Orwell uh, you know people talk about 1984 and Animal Farm but he did a book called uh, Down and Out in Paris in London which was an amazing a piece of reportage on on the homeless um so uh i suppose you know, it's weird i didn't actually sort of go and cry in a corner and think well woe is me it was almost uh a time of um almost a rite of passage i suppose without i hope that's not going too mm. far over the top but it, it was basically i was pretty comfortable in my own skin this was at a time when I'd been bombarding the local paper with un, yeah. uh, you know, un, uncalled for pieces of uh, gibberish from local <laughs> you know, junior football. Um, but you know, I, I suppose I was very, very lucky. You were quite resourceful. You seemed to get a routine going, which must have helped as well. Plus, of course, you had your uh, shoot magazine, League Ladders. Uh, you did what many, many kids did with these things. You created your own fictional league yes i suppose football you know one of the great blessings of football is that you actually don't need a game which is a you know a really strange thing to say when you think about it because um it was a primitive form of fantasy football it literally was played out in my imagination um there was a little bit of schoolboy vindictiveness in there i needed to get um Watford my team into the first division as was I didn't I didn't like Leeds United I hated the pretension I used to loathe the um, the sock tags and you know the the very sort of staged games of uh, of carpet bowls that Don River used to trot out um, so there was uh, hands up I put my I, you know, I put my hands up there it, it was uh, a bit a bit of malice involved in that um, but I suppose you know I if it's not in front of you, you do create your own world. You are resourceful, as you, as you said, Tim. You know, and it's also it gave it. There was a purpose. I suppose everything that I did as a kid, and I it almost had a purpose. Um, and it was from the experience I had at the age of eleven when I was a ball boy. Um, you know, Watford beat um, Liverpool one nil in the FA Cup quarter final. Bill Shankly broke up his first great Liverpool team because of that. It was the day I saw my first grown man cry. He was a Liverpool fan in a uh, an industrial donkey jacket uh, with a big long scarf, absolutely replete with with badges, uh, sinking into the fence. In just absolute, he was in an emotional abyss. And around him, there were all these Watford fans. I can, re I can still remember, and I've actually dug out one of the photographs for the book, where the goal scorer was a, a, you know, a classic journeyman footballer called Barry Ending. Uh, Watford had got him for fifty pounds uh, from a pub team, and uh, he scored the goal. And the, this photograph captures captures him turning to face his teammates who are running towards him, and behind him. They're just a sea of faces. You know, you know that great Barry Davis line, look at his face, look at his face. That's what that's exactly <laughs> what that photograph screamed at me. And it was old, uh, young, you know, and, and I, I remember being on the touchline and looking around and there were people hanging off the side of the stand, quite literally, 
they have one hand on the wooden um, side of the stand. The other hand was this semaphore of just euphoria. And I just thought, wow, this is amazing. I want to I want to I want to be part of this. I want this to be my life and I want to be able to describe it. So from that moment on, I pretty much knew what I wanted to do and it was then just a question of of trying to get into what, you know, obviously is a pretty insanely competitive business. I just I was just lucky that I was uh, I ended up in the right time uh, at the right place at the right time. Your your first actual introduction to football, though, this, there was no glamour attached to this, was there? It was your dad taking you to watch Workington. Uh, mm. Which ironically was where Bill Shankly was in the in the fifties, and you mentioned, of course, uh, the uh, the Spurs legend uh, that was was Keith Birkinshaw. And mm. you talk about local heroes, and it seemed that if you were growing up in the sixties and the seventies, um, every club seemed to have a local hero. Not not a Bowles or a Marinella or a Hudson or, or any of that lot, but somebody like a Johnny Martin. Mm. Yes, um, the player, he, he was almost a, uh, a, a, well, he used to call himself the poor man's George Best. And his party trick was, was to actually dribble with the ball, sit on it and invite uh, a defender to take it off him. <laughs> and on one, on one occasion, he actually uh, sat on it and he'd been given a pint of beer by someone in the crowd and he actually drank a little bit and before giving it back. Now, how he, how he managed to survive... <laughs> the vengeance attacks that that must have prompted is amazing but so there's someone that um yeah to be honest uh, when i was doing some research I, I you know i had these vague memories about him but i'd forgotten uh, about him in many ways but the thing is also these people you know, people you know i've been i say it's hugely fortunate to you know, to meet some you know, iconic figures you know ali and mandela and people like that but actually to me I'm I'm just as intrigued by well what did happen to Johnny Martin you know he went he he, he moved out to uh, the Canary Islands came back ran a Safeway supermarket for a little bit came back and played for a year uh, he passed away of leukemia um, I think about six or seven years ago that was a man there was a moment in time that was an individual who meant something. To a very small, or relatively small number of people, but he was he was the definition of a hero, and I suppose what I try to get through in the book is this: well, what is a hero? Well, certainly they're made of flesh and blood, like you and I, because um, people always you know one of the one of the, the the questions that you get, and I'm sure you get the same thing, Tim, is, oh, what's so and so like? And um, you know, I'm speaking now in my study, and I'm looking up at a photograph of of me. It, interviewing Ali we're interviewing inverted commas uh, it, but it's in the it's in the it's the is in the middle of Park Lane he, he walked out of the Hilton Hotel and stopped the traffic four lanes of traffic he just stopped it held court in the middle there and I was a kid then I was about 1920 something like that and I had sharp elbows there and so you get to the front of the scrum and you know you're then facing this icon so there was something there that I suppose because I was so young, so naive, I looked at this hero, felt the aura, and thought, "This man is immortal." You know, he's be he, he, he's beyond life's pain. Now, I didn't realise at the time he was just showing the first signs of Parkinson's, and if you flash that forward, because one of the great privileges of of what I do is that some you know the the the, the life cycle of of people I write about, you actually match their life cycle. So with, with Ali, 20 years later, I was in a place called Auburn Hills in Michigan covering uh, a Mike Tyson fight against a Polish uh, pacifist by the name of Andrew Galotta. <laughs> Galotta. Who, yeah, who surrendered after two rounds. And, you know, uh, I, th I think from memory, uh, Tyson had um, some post-fight problems with uh, being tested positive for marijuana. But frankly, I wasn't interested in that. I was absolutely captivated by the sight of Ali. Now, this is four years, remember, after the world realised his plight uh, at the Atlanta Olympics. And he, you know, I, I call it in the book, a human earthquake. When he turns up, there are just bodies flying all over the place and squealing and everything else. And it was just like, you know, the, the soundtrack to his life, I suppose. 
but he sat opposite us. We, you know, and one of the great things about when you're covering boxing is that you are very close to the action. You know, close enough sometimes to get blood and phlegm and spit all over your notebook. But he, when he sat down, I could not take my eyes off him because his daughter Layla was um, topping the undercard in a six round fight. And as the first bell sounded, he just covered his face with his hands. He couldn't bear to look. And he didn't lower his hands until the bell went for the end of the round. Wiped his brow with his white handkerchief and repeated it over five or six, well, for, for the six rounds. Now that is what a hero, a hero is like you and I, Tim. Same instincts. Different experiences of life, but same. You know, cut them and they bleed. Shout at them and they'll wince. And there was, Ali wasn't Ali the legend. It wasn't Ali the most famous man on the planet. It was Ali a concerned parent who could not bear to see his daughter being punched in the head. Mm. That, that had a big effect on me. So, last thing about the uh, the Johnny Martin, the hero, the the Cumbrian cult hero. I loved the story about the fan who ran onto the pitch with a crown in his hand, yeah. uh, and he knelt on one knee whilst the fan put it on, and he said, "Arose the King of Dermont Road." I yeah. got a yellow. He said it was it was brilliant. But when you go on, you, you're still a kid, and these sort of rites of passage, you know, the the moment that you get your little card that allows you as a ball boy to enter via the officials entrance the players and officials I, I distinctly remember the first time I ever got a press card and being able to park your car and and stride the moment you got close you almost felt as if you were you know part of the team yeah you're you're part of the inner circle aren't you well, you feel you you kid yourself that you're part of the inner circle yeah um <laughs> and yeah i can still i can still now as we're speaking i can still visualize the my season pass as a ball boy it was cardboard and it was green uh with black lettering and uh they gave you a little plastic um wallet to put it in and you know i guarded that with my life um and going in through that entrance that you talk about it was it was like entering narnia basically you know, uh, <laughs> there were some really, really, you walked down some very, very steep steps and, um, you know, the dignitaries walked straight on into the, into the, the heart of the old wooden main stand and uh, there was a very small boardroom just around the corner. And I threw a left and then the first right uh, went into a, essentially, uh, there, was, there was a little groundsman's cubby hole, you know, with, you know, old bits of tea and, digestives and god knows what else in and then into this laundry room and it, this laundry room was the the province of a lady called molly rush and her alsatian saber i used to turn up to every match um and it smelled of football it was next door yeah. it was next door to the it was next door to the home dressing room so you you heard these sort of muffled entreaties and next door you know that sound of movement you could hear the crowd begin to gather. There was a frosted sunlight, um, but the noise used to filter through. But the smell has stuck with me over the years. It was stale sweat, bit of um, bit of soap powder, um, soil, wet grass. It was this whole sort of aroma you know it, it, i suppose you know it's funny enough i suppose if we were entrepreneurs tim what we do is we'd bottle that and sell this sell yeah. sell that <laughs> scent to about 14 year old boys you know they'd love it um but um you know i don't know what you call it um thud or something i don't know but um it's it's uh and i suppose again you know as i said earlier the great thing about being a ball boy was that sense of intimacy and you know you're part of the show however m minuscule being on the touchline that, again that one of the one of the what i've always tried to do especially in my books is try to humanize football or humanize sport in general and that goes back to those days when you're on a touchline you can actually see that you know you're, you're a kid 
and you don't really know what professional sport is all about and the insecurities of it and everything else. But you do see the fear in someone's eyes when he goes down and he's hurt. You know, that sort of him mm. looking looking at the, the, the sponge man or, you know, you can, you, you, you hear the tackle. You know, you can hear the, the clash of, of stud on, on shin pad. And by the way, in those days, they were shin pads. They weren't sort of, um, you know, uh, cardboard. I was not, not cardboard, but they, they, they weren't certainly sort of uh, little cutout pieces of, of protection. So I suppose, uh, and, and you, the, the players that you just, you know, gawped at, actually, we saw, you saw them in their civvies. So, and, and, you, and you begin to hear stories of sightings, like, you know, one of the fullbacks, a guy called Johnny Williams, used to love a full English just down the road. Uh, Tom Wally was this um, very flinty midfield player, Welsh guy, who actually became a very, very good uh, youth coach, actually basically created at Ashley Cole. Um, he, used to, he used to send the apprentices, he used to terrorise the, uh, the apprentices and used to send them down the road for a chip butty. So, you know, we live in an age today of, of, of nutrition and, and uh, you know, red zones and science and everything else. Well, you know, you can't, you can't beat, a, you know, a good carry out from Friday's, the, the fish and chip shop, which is just down the road. Tell me, what was the, the conversation like in your house on the, uh, the day that you informed your parents, if indeed you did, that you were uh, jacking in the A-levels to take a job as a junior reporter? You got a pretty frosty response as well, didn't you, from your, uh, from your teacher at the time, the trog? Uh, yeah, my, head, my headmaster. Yeah, Trog. Yeah, um, yeah. It was, it, it was, you know, the Watford Observer was. I'd, I'd been bombarding the the, the paper for, for, as I say, for a few years. I think they probably got sick of me in the end. But um, and that's actually quite a good tip for for any budding journo out there. Um, just make yourself a nuisance, and sometimes people will tell you stuff just to get rid of you. So um, I suppose you know the it was yin and yang the reaction. Uh, my headmaster was this, uh, frankly, a terrible snob. Um, he, uh, he looked at me when I told him as if I'd sort of defecated on his desk. It was just like, oh my Lord, uh, nothing will come of this Calvin was the uh, precise quote. So, okay, fine. Um, but, uh, when I showed my mum, the letter was from, a, uh, my first editor, E.R. Foster, Ernie Foster. And it was about, it's three lines basically. Uh, you know, we're pleased to tell you that, uh, you know, you've, uh, uh, been selected for the role of uh, training sports reporter. Um, bloody blah, you're going to be paid tuppence and uh, turn up on nine o'clock on Monday morning. Uh, and my mum cried and uh, she set me off because I'm, I'm a bit of a crier on the quiet. So uh, it was lovely to see. And it, there was a huge sense of um, achievement, I suppose. Uh, you know, I, I bluffed my way through a few O levels at the time, um, but I didn't did that with no sense of real achievement. Um, didn't really mean that much to me, I suppose. But this was my springboard, and this is what I've been waiting for since I was an eleven-year-old kid. And I was fortunate that I had a brilliant tutor in my first sports editor, Ollie Phillips. Um, he works for the Watford Observer for fifty-eight years covering Watford, specifically the club, but also uh, the community in general, the town in general. And he was a lovely writer and could quite easily have made it, in inverted commas, in Fleet Street uh, at that time. But he preferred to stay close to the community and reflect and almost amplify the, the voice of that community. Uh, he almost became the voice of that community, actually. We used to go back in, into history and, and, and look at you know, the various aspects of the town. Um, really great old school journal. Um, we differed on, he tried to introduce me to Bob Dylan and I've never been able to get, out, get my head around Bob Dylan or Radiohead or Pink Floyd apart from that. Uh, I thought I might as well get my prejudices out <laughs> in the open. Well, you did get um, into David Bowie though, didn't you? Oh yeah, very much so. He was, he was my first album, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was, I suppose, yeah, it was just the, 
the ritual you know you talked earlier on about belonging and you know mm. you, you, when you got a press pass you think you belong and there is a sort of sense of, of brotherhood about it and it does it, it, it does re re-emerge occasionally across the years um you know there is this sort of international brotherhood of of, of journalism if you like and, and that sounds terribly pompous but in practical terms it works and i'll give you a a perfect example and one of the things you know as a sports writer the thing that they always throw at us is oh well you work in a toy department well <laughs> sport gives you access to to moments of great political significance social significance cultural mm. significance uh and in this case um it allows you access beyond um normal news reporters so for instance on this this occasion Martial law was declared in Poland. Um, it was completely off limits to uh, English journos, um, but they had to let some accredited football guys in with the England under-21 team for a European Championship match in Warsaw. Uh, frankly, we all knew what we were going in there to do, uh, which was to do some um, eyewitness stuff. And... Uh, we made contact with the local journos who basically set up uh, interviews with solidarity activists, political activists. And it was certainly the most surreal setting for an interview I've ever done, uh, which was um, yeah, in, in uh, the Arch Cathedral in Warsaw. Uh, we play the role, uh, because obviously we've been going to be followed, we play the role of penitents and going to give confession we walk into the confessional and on the other side of the grill where the priest usually sits uh, there was a solidarity activist who basically gave us chapter and verse about the, the, the food shortages the police brutality etc etc and it was the only time or the, one of the few times where the world was able to actually have a well, we had a window into that other world uh, which was provided by sport england won that night um and it was uh you know a really interesting occasion uh, because you know the polish fans were openly baiting the soldiers they were they sang the national anthem with unbelievable passion and so you, from that you get an idea of what sport can mean so we got that access simply because other journos wanted us to try and do our job as well as we could they wanted to help us do our job and it was fantastic to do so the time that you were at the uh, watford observer you were there you were there at a great time because luther blissett was was coming through you reported on his uh, debut for his club and international debut and in italy when yeah. he was over there as well and you mentioned tom wally yeah. uh, who went on to, to coach it was he persuading graham taylor to, to keep him on and give him a go because wasn't Graham Taylor going to let him go? Um, I think Graham did what all new managers do and, and just basically have a look at what he's inherited. Uh, but Tom did point out that um, Luther was worth uh, persevering with. Um, and I suppose in many ways that is a really good indication of how fine the margins are in professional sport. It only needed Tom to have flu and not turn up when Graham's around or just not think it was his place to actually tell the new manager what to do, Luther could have been released. We would have been released. And where would, have his, where would his career have been then? And here's someone who has become an iconic figure within the town and the club. Um, lovely guy. Absolutely terrific guy. Um, great social conscience and someone who is proud of that community in the way that the community is proud of him and i found um dealing with him and you see this is where the weird thing is he was a 16 year old when i first the first team that i i covered for the paper a uh, proper team you know i did sunday league football and stuff but uh, was the watford under 18s and they played at a place called woodside which is um, in north watford and Luther was basically killing the Southeast Counties League, scoring lots of goals. 
And I was quite scared of him, not scared of him, intimidated by him. Because here's a kid of my same age, lovely guy, but I'm thinking he's got to be, a, you know, he's a superstar, this guy. In my own little world, he was. And it took me time to get to know him a little bit. And, and then you know, the scales fall off the eyes, don't they? And, you know, we've, mm. we, we've kept in touch, you know, pretty much ever since. And, um, you know, he even, uh, his partner uh, actually was one of the girls from Watford Girls Grammar School who used to come and visit me um, at, uh, at when I was in hospital with TB. Um, you know, she used, you know, they, they couldn't come into the ward. They were, they used to sort of talk to me through the window. Um, so yeah, small world and all that, but, um, I suppose, you know, that's the thing also that stuck with me. Um, again, the great thing I think about doing books is that, okay, you know, as chief sports writer on the telegraph and times and columnist and things like that, you, you probably get 1200 words max. You know, thousand words maybe. Obviously, you know, now in an age of, you know, the long reads, the five or ten thousand word reads. But by and large, you don't get enough time to actually get into the subject and get underneath it, get underneath the bonnet, if you like. And books enabled me to do that. And certainly, the turning point for me was uh, writing a book called Family, uh, which was a season embedded at Millwall, and that was my finishing school in my football education because uh, Kenny Jacket, who, who grew up on, you know, we were childhood friends on, on the same council estate in Watford. He obviously went on to play for Watford, um, represented Wales, um, then obviously had a, has still got a very good managerial career. He was in charge at Millwall and I called and basically said, look, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to. I want to basically do a, a, a fly on the wall piece about you know, Millwall as a club, but the group, the dynamics, the human dynamics of it. And I, I just expected to be laughed out of the, laughed out of the of the ground. But he actually said, "Yeah, I think that's a good idea." And he got his permission from the chief exec and the owner, uh, who understood that it might able they might be able to break down the stereotypes about Millwall and essentially I was accepting into the group uh, in the dressing room all the time uh, on the bench during games in coaches meeting meetings board board meetings you know pretty much the the whole nine yards and I learned I saw then the insecurity of the game I saw the fear that's in there you know I mentioned you get a hint of it when you're a ball boy but when you're in in a dressing room and you experience football life in the raw it is something really special yeah you see friends falling out with one another uh mm -hmm. you see yeah that don't worry mm -hmm. sort of surge of alarm just before or either alarm or excitement just before about five to three when the the linesman or the referee knocks on the door you understand that this matters because these guys have got mortgages they've got families and the manager in essence has the power of life and death over him certainly professionally and that i found compelling absolutely compelling. you moved on to actually work with uh, with haters didn't you after moving from from watford and this is this is where you, you get a real feel for what this mm. job is actually about and what it's like you're covering up to 10 games a week from varying levels and you, you got to a point where you were having moments of anxiety dreams about things going badly wrong at live events in press boxes yeah yeah that stays with you actually i still get them I still get them today uh <laughs> yeah the classic dream the classic anxiety dream is um you know you're in a press box and then you <clears throat> nothing's working and so you pick up the phone and um do what we call an ad lib or used to call an ad lib it's a, it's a lost art now but essentially it means just basically picking up a phone to london and crafting the piece and the you know the, the structure of it and you know the nuance of it as you go along and i used to love it because i i found i could do it quite comfortably it enabled me to reflect the mood and the uh, the rhythms of a game or even 
the parameters of a debate. I did a 1500 word ad lib um, the moment at 20 to 4 in the morning in Seoul when we realised that uh, Ben Johnson had been uh, done for drugs. Um, so I loved doing that. And I found that um, I suppose there's a real freedom of expression in that. What happens at place like haters? You know, haters basically has has created you know a, several generations of, of of sports writers, leading sports writers, and that's no coincidence because it is a bit of a sink or swim profession. You just bunged in, really. You throw in, and if you if you sink, well, I'm sorry, chap. You know, we'll get someone else who can swim. Um, and it's you, you you acquire a bit of insouciance you know you, you 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 this little bit of sort of arrogance oh yeah well i can't do anything you know i'm, I'm 19 I, i'm in fleet street i can do anything and i remember being called in by reg hater who's uh, the owner a great guy one of the great guys um his journalistic career began just after the second world war when he used to go on a boat for six weeks to cover the ashes with the team england team um became a bit of an agent uh and this particular day um he said right calvin um we've got a, a rush order from the world of sport annual and uh two thousand words and so i'm sort of thinking, oh yeah fine well that's easy peasy i can do two thousand words in a day uh it's on competitive <laughs> frog jumping and i said what <laughs> you know you think are you serious and you know, and Reg actually didn't joke about stuff like that because it usually ended up getting paid because of it. So that was that was the first lesson you had when you worked for him, uh, the power of the pound note. But basically, we he said, well, look, he, he recalled a short story by Mark Twain about a frog jumping contest in California. So this, remember, is pre-internet. It's pre-Mr. Google. So I'm thinking, well, what on earth am I going to do here? And out of desperation, really, I phoned the press office at the US Embassy, working on the principle of Reg's frog jumping contest in California. And I, you know, it was one of those, look, you're never going to guess what I'm going to ask you here, but, and, and it was basically a, a, just a complete coincidence that the guy that I spoke to, he said, ah, he said, I know the guy who might be able to help you. And anyway, this guy came from Louisiana and, and he actually knew of a little bit about it. And he, he talked about the type of frogs they use. And I'm thinking, right, I'm on my way now. You know, uh, frog, you know, the, I don't know, the great bullhorn frog or whatever it would be. OK, I'll go to my Encyclopedia Britannica. And, blah, 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 you know, so it's like, so you, I suppose the, the overwhelming lesson of that is you just do it. You know, and as, as Reg used to say, if you can't write, a good piece write a bad piece but get it in on time and and that yeah you know, that was that was one of the great that was one of the great sort of disciplines of the trade really that you you had to um think on your feet and i think that's and you had to talk to people you, see, you know i'm not going to do the uh, it was wonderful in my day and it's awful now routine but certainly the one thing that i do when i talk to young journalists or aspiring writers talk to people Get, to get get on their wavelength. You never know what you'll get out of it. Um, don't just trawl through internet. Through tr tr don't just trawl through the internet. Um, but it, the, the the interesting thing, I suppose, also with with uh, with Reg is that it just you know I talked about Narnia earlier on going down the stairs into the Watford laundry room, but to go up the stairs. At Lords, the old stairs into the old press box in the Warner stand. At nineteen, I was um, uh, Reg. Reg um, basically ordered me to to be uh, Dennis Compton's ghostwriter. This is his Sunday and Express column, yeah. That's the one, yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so you know, the the clans were well. The weekly uh, routine usually involved going to a legendary Fleet Street watering hole called Elvino's, uh, and you know they they it was Reg would be with um, Richie Benno, Keith Miller, the great Australian fast bowler, Bill Edridge, who was uh, Dennis's best mate, and Dennis himself, and they basically drain a few bottles of claret, and I would go in there and be ushered into the 
into into legend and said right okay Dennis what we're going to do this week uh, and he had the same answer almost every time I spoke to him which was oh I'm sure you I'm sure you'll come up with a you know a great idea old boy you know it was just basically a oh, go away little man you know just just go away and write a few things and uh, show me what you come up with not in a, and that's not in a nasty way whatsoever he didn't have a bad bone in his body Dennis he was lovely when he used to go up to the, the top of the press box at Lords during during the Lords Test matches, it was again that was Narnia because you'd have on the left hand aisle you'd have John Arlott tapping away and creating this poetry that he used to come up with, and he'd always have a, a you know a post dinner oh sorry post lunch uh, bottle of claret by him by his side. You'd have Len Hutton in the back row. Quite, I, I remember him literally sucking his pencil and making some notes for his appointment with his ghostwriter at um, uh, at Teton. <laughs> You'd have Fred Truman, who used to do the radio commentaries next door, sort of walking around in this mushroom cloud of pipe smoke, um, <laughs> talking to anyone who was who, who wanted to speak. And you had Dennis at the end with a with a gin and tonic the size of a bucket. Um, uh, you know, basically just you. Know, being Dennis, and it was beautiful. And uh, again, it was. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure you did a great job, old boy. And uh, yeah, so basically, I was Dennis Compton for a couple of years. And it was, it was. It, 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 and I suppose when you work for someone like Reg, it's an accelerated form of development. So that I learned more in eighteen months or two years with him than it would have taken. It would have taken ten years to go anywhere. And also, it just you know the office was just off Fleet Street and you absolutely drank in the atmosphere of, of Fleet Street you could you know there was that sweet smell of, of printer's ink there were the the vents you used to get you know all the all the you know the the tramps used to go and and, and lie on the um over over the vents where the the heat from the printing presses would come up um you know, I got my first job in Fleet Street, or my, my Telegraph job, uh, from uh, the sports editor at the time, Ted Barrett. Uh, my interview was in the pub. Uh, at, uh, there's a little sort of tiny, very narrow pub called the King and Keys, which was next to 85 Fleet Street, which is the, the, the Telegraph offices. And it was that sort of pub, uh, Tim, that you stuck, you know, your feet stuck to the carpet. And if the walls could talk, Wow, what a bestseller that would be. Um, and I suppose, you know, I'm not going to glorify um, alcohol, but certainly that was a fundamental element of working in Fleet Street at that particular time. You know, we were, as a, as a junior sports guy on the Telegraph, there were a group of us on the various national newspapers, and we used to basically divvy up visits to the major training grounds. Uh, so... And Nigel Clark, who was the Express at the, or the, the the Mirror at the time, would go to Arsenal. I'd go to Chelsea. A really good guy called Malcolm Foley would go uh, maybe to West Ham or whatever it is. And we get we we turn up about half past three um, in a pub and wouldn't leave. And we'd share out the stories and we say, okay, we'll keep that one for tomorrow and we'll do this one today. <laughs> and um, we would phone in our copy, you know, fifty yards across across the road, because uh, we didn't really want to go into the office. So it was, it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was a. I suppose also when people ask me, you know, the great thing that we had there was a sense, one sense of camaraderie. Two, we actually spoke to people, and again, when we talk about these life cycles, the players that we first met in those earlier days. They went through their careers, some became coaches, managers, and you almost progressed with them. Um, you know, um, Ray Wilkins became a good friend, and we were literally thrown together by fate in terms of uh, my first World Cup was when I was with a, a, a chain of regional newspapers called Westminster Press. I was their chief sports writer, which sounds really, really grand, but I was their only sports writer. And... You know, such as you know, Gareth Southgate has done some fantastic work in the whole, you know, the whole sort of um, 
public facing role of the team and 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 his staff you know england used to be basically the england training camp used to be camp paranoia now it's very welcoming um but right back in 82 relations with the the written press were you know very good and to the extent that when we turned up in bilbao on the same plane which is unheard of these days um they gave us a lift to, the, to our hotel in the team bus. And I just happened. I was going to say, was this the time that you first begin to notice that there's a division between, or starting to appear, between certain sections of the media, from the quality press to the to the red <laughs> top press and the, uh, what you call, I think at the time, the, uh, the it was a brilliant term, the rotters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the the rotters actually. You know, I suppose working for Reg, you know, you, you're always aware because you have to. The great thing also about developing as a writer is that you know you, you mentioned that you did ten games a week. Well, okay, within those games, you might have to do six different pieces. One maybe for the Telegraph, one for the Sun, or whatever, so that you you learn to actually write in different styles. But you know, I digress. The rotters were uh, a pretty much like a journalistic supernova, really. Um, they turned up, they, they announced themselves. They, they, they used to coalesce around a brilliant guy called John Jackson. Yes, today. remember him, yeah. <laughs> and Jacko, good old Jacko. And, and he basically excelled himself and introduced the Rotters by creating, and I was, in the, I was actually in the room, uh, there was a brawl in the Wimbledon press room, the interview room, which was, uh, well, basically, there was, the American tennis writers tend to uh, tend to they, well, they don't ask questions; they give speeches. And uh, at the end of one of these speeches, Jacko sort of said out of the corner of his mouth, he was he was actually asking a question of John, of John McEnroe at the time, and Jacko said, "Oh, that was a good question, wasn't it?" And then and the guy could, took umbrage. The next thing you know, it's like the Wild West; people are throwing chairs at one another. <laughs> so it was. So that's why they that's how they they introduced themselves, and then they always used to turn up at big sports occasions because sports sold newspapers front and back of the book, and with big events they had a pretty they had a playbook that they would always do. Uh, first off, it would be uh, a ring of steel. A ring of steel was thrown around uh, the England football team stroke British Olympic team last night when X and Y was threatened. Well. Uh, they did that uh, when we arrived in Bilbao, but their piece de resistance was uh, something, a story called, um, well, it's the legend of Deg Dog Beach. So uh, the England team were in a hotel called uh, Los Tamarises, which is at the end of a lane next to a huge cliff. It was chosen for security reasons because that was at a time when Etta were very active. But the, the team used to have breakfast on a terrace overlooking the beach. And uh, one morning, when they were you know, coming down out of their cornflakes or whatever, a photographer captured them, uh, but took the, 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 the shot was such that it showed this dead dog literally underneath where they were eating. So... The, the the rotters turned this into a full scale health scare. You know, England in, in England um, uh, basically, you know, uh, you know in, in disease ridden beach, blah blah blah, whatever it would be. And it took a while and several covert drinks to work out what had happened or to find out what had happened. And, and what happened was, um, I shouldn't really laugh, but one of one of the rotters had noticed that uh, there was a dog which was roadkill and so he paid some local kids to pick the dog up and transport it to the beach underneath the um uh underneath the uh, the terrace where that where the england players were and there we are front page lead fleet street legend um created out of absolutely zero but it was just uh, the interesting thing was, and, and in, in a sort of subtle way, the England management got their own back because that was at a time there were huge doubts about Kevin Keegan's fitness for that World Cup. And they smuggled him out of the hotel uh, in a Fiat 500 uh, owned or driven by the hotel receptionist 
who took him to Bilbao Airport and then on to Madrid and then on to Hamburg for some treatment. No one knew about that. Now, I'm not sure about the medical logic of putting someone with a back condition <laughs> into a Fiat 500, but, uh, you know, that, so they got their, they got their, um, they got one over the, the rotters, but it, they, they were, yeah, they, there was a, there was an element of, of, of sort of self-deprecation about what they did. And, you know, they, some of the stuff, and it got, it got a little bit tiresome sometimes, but, um, also, there were sometimes you, you actually would say you did what? Uh, there was the, the one time. The one time that uh, you know, I really remember, and it's funny enough. You know, as I said earlier on, sports gives gives you access and insight into into not just the human condition, but the whole sort of social structure and everything. And um, on the England Rebel cricket tour. Uh, in uh, 1990, 1990. Um, it was the first time I'd taken sides, actually. Um, dying days of apartheid. Um, I'd been briefed beforehand by a guy called Sam Ramsamy, who went on to become uh, a South Africa's IOC member, put me in touch with ANC activists at the time, who all, as... as um, multiracial democracy took hold became very very powerful figures in their own rights within the, the, the um you know within the um the, the regime at the time or the government at the time what happened was when we arrived uh again we arrived with the team well most of us did and the police set the dogs on the protesters who were waiting inside um, what was then Jan Smuts Airport. And it was the, the scenes were appalling, they were awful. And um, Bill Deeds, who was my editor at the, te the Telegraph at the time, put it on the front page. I, I did a piece about the image that I sort of projected in my intro was, was of blood sort of slowly congealing as it was running down these mar this marble staircase where the basically they cornered all the protesters. And, you know, that caused, you know, more than a few ripples, a couple of, well, certainly one particular, late, um, sorry, Tory MP tried to get me sacked. Bill said we support our boy. And the first game was uh, in Kimberley, a, a diamond uh, mining area. And again, there were 3,000 protesters. They set the dogs on there. Didn't the mayor give them all a diamond? Yes, he did, yeah. Uh, basically, um, there was a guy, uh, the, the tour was organized by Dr. Ali Baca, who mm. in South African terms at that particular stage was, was, a, was a liberal. He was in this case, severely misguided, uh, I feel, and still do, um, because one, it just was, it just didn't fit with the times. You know, there was stuff going on in the background, negotiations for the re release of Nelson Mandela. The mood was changing, yet what we had there was hardline Afrikanderdom in action. You had thousands of people marching on this ground in, in Kimberley, um, while, as you say, the uh, the the mayor of the of the town was was giving each um each player his his four pieces of the silver if you like mm. yeah. his, his his diamond um so i hated that mike gatting was absolutely the captain was was absolutely tone deaf when we when we spoke to him after that you know some really quite awful scenes um you know, so I, we just thought there was a bit of singing and dancing. Well, it, it, was, it was a lot. It was it was an awful experience. It was preceded by uh, a story that I think it was Jacko did, where he announced on the morning of the game his piece was um, there are fears that there will be a sniper in the scoreboard uh, at uh, the um, Kimberley Oval tomorrow morning when England's Rebel Cricketers begin their tour. Which was, you know, frankly, complete jackanory, but it, it just got everyone's attention quite a bit. Um, 
But I, I suppose, again... They must have known, though, didn't they, at the time? I mean, yeah. Because you, you make a point to say that, you know, when they turned up there, the waiters wouldn't serve the team, the maids mm. wouldn't clean the rooms, you had bags mm. tampered with, with this really yeah. sort of quite disturbing thing where they would move a piece of clothing from your drawer and place it over the suitcase handle. Yeah, yeah, it was... It was, as I said, it was the first time ever in, in my journalistic life I actually took, took sides um, because you, know, you see the social inequality. And I think to actually write about anything, you've got to have a, I think you've got to have a conscience of sorts. And you've got to have, a, I think, an empathetic approach to you know, the, either the subjects that you write about or the people you write about. Mm. Um, and I suppose the... When you when you go into, you know, Ali Backer used to take us into the townships, to to you know there were certain projects that he was um, um, pushing forward. There was he there was a there was a player that he was pushing as a young kid called Walter Massimola, who was a big fast bowler, but um, he he never made it. Um, I think eventually he died of cirrhosis of the liver, um, early forties. But you saw the you saw the squatter and just thought, well, this isn't right. This is not right. And uh, I found it interesting again this whole idea of, of of time passing and you you know your perspective shifting or changing. The people that told me, well, okay, today's demonstration is half past two at the corner of X and Y. You know, if it rains, we'll we'll hold it in the village hall, sort of stuff. Uh, all those guys became key government figures. And I also went back, so I went back at first um, rugby tour, um, uh, you know, fully multiracial rugby tour, which was Will Carling's England. It was also the first, uh, you know, I went to the first Rugby World Cup in 95 when obviously rugby was changing massively in terms of that shift, very clumsy shift from amateurism to professionalism. And yeah, you see, you see things and you, you see the world as it is, I, I suppose. And, you know, going back there in 2010 for, for the, the Football World Cup, you saw the same squatter camps that were there 20 years before in the, you know, the bad old days. Uh, and, you know, you, you do question sometimes, because you know, the thing about international sport, it, it almost indulges politicians who have a delusion of grandeur you know why spend x billion organizing a um a, a world cup when 70 percent of your population haven't got running water or reliable electricity i, I that, that's sometimes where I, I i struggle with that to be honest sometimes mm. um but i suppose you do see the joy the joy that sport can give. Had you reached a point in your career where you thought that, you know, uh, I, I need something to actually challenge me significantly more than, uh, you know, just going to uncomfortable places, you know, like East Germany before the war came down, etc. What was the reason behind you taking up what was your greatest life challenge, which was the British Steel uh, Challenge, the eight-month amateur yacht race around the world but not only around the world around the world uh, into the prevailing winds which was called literally utter madness by everybody concerned it's a little schoolboy in me coming out i suppose tim uh it was something i always wanted i'd always wanted as a kid to sail around cape horn and um the um the the, the chance came up with great guy called uh, Che Blythe uh, or Sir Che Blythe as he is now he wanted to challenge the uh, convention that it would be as you said madness to go around the world the wrong way uh, with a bunch of amateurs and um, again I suppose this is how the newspaper business has changed at that time I was chief sports writer of the, of the Telegraph so you know that meant I had to do all the big events um, as you know, their supposed voice, I suppose. Um, and I went to um, 
David Welsh, who was a fantastic sports editor, really innovative. He was the one who um, produced the first sports supplement and said, look, you know, I needed a year off the diary. And, you know, I expected him just to laugh in my face. And he said, well, again, why? So I explained this and I said, I think this is going to be unique uh, and I really want to do it. And so he gave me a year off, basically. Well, he gave me a year to do the job and, and gave me a platform. And, yeah, it was a huge experience, as you said, a life, a life experience. Uh, Did you realise that you were, you were putting your life literally on, on the line and there was a possibility that you might not come back? Uh, the only time I did that probably was when we were just about to leave Rio uh, for the Cape Horn legs and go around the Cape Horn the wrong way across the Southern Ocean where you do about 2,000 miles where you are literally beyond rescue uh, and ended up in, in Hobart in Tasmania. The, ra the race, as I said, ran the wrong world, round the world the wrong way, Southampton, Southampton, Rio, Rio, Hobart, Hobart, Cape Town, Cape Town, home. Um, and there were moments, you know, again, when you get back, the first question people ask, were, were you afraid? Well, no, I, it's weird because it's not so much fear. I, I was just in awe of it because it, it is, you know, quite literally elemental. Yeah, and the the sea is not just a random collection of of, of molecules, water molecules. It's actually it's 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 a living being, you, and you feel it, and you sense its moods. Now, I know that sounds really sort of strange and even quite trite sitting here now, but when you're on deck, when you come up on deck, and you you know you just feel it's in your bones. You think, well, we're going to get a right kick in here, and then you know. Two hours later, there's a, there's a squall comes in and it's carnage. Um, and that, I suppose, was, yeah, it was a fundamental experience for me because when you, you know, it, the irony was, you've ne I've never been as far removed from, you know, what we take as the real world, uh, but I'd never felt so close to the world, if you know what I mean. It, there was this... Yeah, you know, the, the, there was this sense of wonder. You know, there was that you used to experience things like, you know, you'd see you know, the only thing that the, the, there's no the, the, there was no light pollution whatsoever. So you'd have this big platinum moon, and sometimes you'd see waves, the white horse waves, almost above your own mast, and you knew you were in a bit of trouble then because you used to go up, used to ride up the mountains of these waves, and then it would hit almost like a plateau and then you'd fall off one so you've got a a steel yacht falling say 30 feet into water and down below you've got people being thrown and people who were strapped in are being thrown through their bunks onto the floor breaking collarbones and everything else um and if you're on deck at that moment you're on you know you're on the end of your lifeline and you just think wow you know I am in the presence here of something bigger than me. And actually, that's not a bad thing to think sometimes, you know, because we do mm. live in a bit of a me, me, me world, don't we? And actually, being in that environment, uh, it can it can make... Well, actually, I'll tell you a story about... Um, my great mentor was uh, Ian Waldridge of the Daily Mail, who was an you know, a, a absolutely sublime columnist and a really, really good man. Um because when I came back from the the, the, the the yacht race, I couldn't take sport seriously. You know, I just thought, well, I, I, I remember going to a, the, the, the Rugby International and thinking, oh, really, is that all it is? Um, and actually, uh, my first instinct, again, David Welsh understood me entirely. He said, OK, we've got this idea. Uh, would you like to go to Falklands? So I went to the Falklands to play well, nominally anyway, to play the world's uh, most remote golf course, which was on Gol uh, Goose Green. Um, and um, a friend of mine uh, was there, a guy called Patrick Watts. And Patrick was the radio announcer uh, in Port Stanley who had to announce at gunpoint the Argentine invasion. And throughout the invasion, he started sending um, sort of almost like codified messages across the airways to, to the Brits to 
give you an give them an idea of what was going on. And basically, I, I stayed with him, and I just sat sat on the on the bays on the on the uh, on the on the cliff tops, looking down at sea, and just feeling the feeling the smelling the sea and feeling the winds coming up from the south and being almost back home again, back you know back on the boat again almost. So I came back home. And my first sort of proper job, if you like, was Ian Botham's last um, first-class cricket match. It was for Durham against the Australians. And I, went, I trolled up for the last day, as all the papers did. And um, the Telegraph gave me the entire back page, which actually you know, was a rare honour, but a complete mistake, because I cringe when I read the piece that I wrote. You know, every other national newspaper was... Ra ra, hail the conquering hero! He walks strides off into the sunset. Bloody bloody blah. And I did this really terrible piece, a very sour piece, which was, uh, and and the headline probably summed it up. Uh, Both them exits, all punch, no punch. And I, it was basically an exercise in kitten drowning. You know, I just thought, what are you doing here? And and. Uh, and David Welsh, for his great credit, didn't say anything. But Woolers pulled me pulled me aside, and he said, "He said, Mike, look, that yacht race can make you, but it can also break you. So what's it going to be?" And you know that was the most elegant bollocking that I've ever had, and uh, it was great because it was administered over about twelve gin and tonics. So um, yeah, I I. I followed my master's words and, and basically got back into it. But I did get back into it um, again through uh, a childhood hero, Bobby Charlton. And Bobby, um, you know, I'd, I'd been in awe of him since I was a, about a seven-year-old boy. Um, going to going to school, going to sort of private, uh, primary school um, on uh, a bus the day after, I remember the day after he scored a, the, 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 you know, the thunder, the thunder goal against Mexico in the 1966 World Cup. I thought, wow, this man's amazing. Um, I'd seen him play with Best and Law as a kid, and then, you know, lo and behold, he's playing in my press team. We're, we're playing in Switzerland, and. One, I'm thinking, well, this isn't real, is it? You know, we're in the dressing room beforehand, and he's going up saying, that's Bobby Charlton. And lo and behold, we're 3-0 down at half-time, thanks largely to my um, incompetence at, at centre-half. And um, Jack Charlton <laughs> was watching us um, basically in hysterics. Um, you know, what he didn't call me or anyone else was, wasn't was wasn't worth calling. And... But we get in the dressing room at half time, so we're three nil down against this and there's quite a big crowd watching. And um Bobby's going around the dressing room saying, We can win this. We get the next goal, we can win this. And I'm thinking, This is Bobby Charlton, what is going on? It just completely unreal. So, Tim, if you imagine yourself, okay, what is the fantasy football outcome of this? And the fantasy football outcome is that you win 5-4, winning goal, last minute, R. Charlton from 30 yards. That is exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. And I suppose that was the day that I, I believed in, I really believed in dreams. And so... Was, was the improvement, by the way, due to you keeping your head up? Uh, no, I basically lurked in the shadows and didn't go anywhere near the ball. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it was it was pretty uh, pretty chastening but again you see that's part of the, the being a press guy you know you you basically play football under false pretenses you know i play i've played at, i've desecrated wembley i've played at about half a dozen premier league football grounds or played in inverted commas i couldn't you know the height of my excellence was division five of the watford sunday league yet you know, normally again, I'm representing my country by playing for an England press team. It's just, it's bonkers. But um, with Bobby, and I, I tried to sort of give an indication of it in the book, I loved the authenticity of the man. And he'd actually written to me when during the yacht race, which was like, 
Well, Bobby Charles just written to me. I, and you were getting, by the way, weren't you, like 25,000 letters yeah. pouring into the Telegraph? It was weird. Yeah, they, they, they took me, when I, when I came back, they took me into a back room, like a post room, and it was full of these bags. Uh, and I thought, well, I can't, I can't sort of write 25,000 letters. But what we did, we did a ronio letter. And I insisted that, you know, OK, we've got addresses uh, and we, we sent them, we sent that out. And but one of them was from from Bobby Charm, which blew my mind because he said, you know, I really identify with what you guys were doing. And so I used that as a pretense to do an interview with him, uh, sort of my, like my sort of, um, you know, coming my transition back into the real world. It was I, because essentially I was away for the first Premier League season and then got a uh, uh, the interview with Bobby, which was a, setting up the, the season in which obviously Fergie's team would get the double. And it, he talked about very passionately about, because um, normally he's quite reserved, but he, he, he talked about football as family. It's the first time I really heard anyone talk about that as a team, as a family. And obviously that was in the context of, of you know the, the, the colleagues who never came back from Munich. And um, he put me back on the straight and narrow, basically, that interview. And I was then off, off again, really, um, you know, on the, on the wild and uh, wacky road of sports, I suppose. The great line, actually, in, the, in the, that piece was the, the sea can seduce, but its savagery must never be forgotten. Yeah, and it's, you know, in, in the book, um, I, I reproduce... Uh, a couple of um, excerpts from my journal. Uh, you know, there. Was, I think probably you know throughout it all, we were conditioned to someone probably dying on the race. Um, tragically, we lost the sailmaker uh, in Rio. He, had, he contracted meningitis, um, but it was on the trip back on the final leg from Cape Town. Um, chap on one of the other boats um, a, uh, from Bath, um, a guy called Bill Vinson, yeah, he dived overboard, committed suicide. And um, the two excerpts on the, in the book, I wanted to reproduce them because uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't read them for 25 years. I'd, I, I'd stuck my journal in, the, in my kit bag, which is up in, you know, up in my attic. Um, but when I was going around for looking for stuff for, for the book and just, you know, verification and everything else, I came across it and it was really powerful because it was, it, I was, it was my confessional, you know, it, I didn't talk to anyone about it. It was just me writing it down on paper and it had a huge effect on us, um, that, you know, we all knew about the attraction of the race and in, in Bill's terms, he, he felt well, certainly his crew members thought that he felt that he didn't have anything to come back to. to. He was a carpenter at Bath University. And um, in a way, the, you know, the, 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 the race had taken him. Um, and, um, you know, his... It, yeah, it, 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 in writing this, actually, funnily enough, it has, it, it's certainly the most personal book that I've ever written. Um, because... Part of me almost bolts at the idea of, of doing a memoir or um, autobiography because I, d I don't think what we do as sports writers or social commentators, if, you, if that's what you want us to be, be called, I don't think what we do is that important, to be honest. Um, I think people might be interested in what we, get, what we do and the experiences that we have, but it's not important. We're not saving lives. We're not, we know, we're not an ITU nurse. You know, it's it's and it's something that I struggle with a bit, but certainly I needed to be really honest with that. And I, I hope within the book people will recognise that it's not just a me 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 um, exercise. That's why I wanted to look at it in a much bigger picture about football mm -hmm. and the nature of heroes and where are we going and and what is the good in because I, I wanted to concentrate also on the good, the good in life and the good in sport and the good in football. And there are some great people out there doing some fantastic stuff in pretty horrendous circumstances. I want to end just with uh, a short nod to the 
people that you've worked with who have been managers, coaches of, of England. Bobby Robson, the most impressive uh, coach in charge of England that, that you dealt with, perhaps you said the most shabbily treated in modern times, especially when you consider what he achieved. Yeah, um, Bobby was, I think, one of football's great humanitarians. And again, I always, I, I, I try to look for authenticity in people, especially those who live their life in that sort of under that magnifying glass of you know that we call fame or celebrity or whatever you want to call it um i the one area one time that i can really remember funny enough it was um i used to see um, bob with his father quite a bit uh, when he was with england bobby's dad phil uh he always used to say to us he said you know my dad was a grafter he said he he never missed a shift in 51 years as a miner and he talked about toiling three miles underground out to sea in little seams no more than two feet high you know hacking out the coal and you'd see bobby with his um father who was quite a wizened man at the time you know that had the classic flat cap on and he was so proud of him he wasn't, you know, he, he wasn't this sort of self-reflective, well, I'm the England manager, I'm the big Bobby Robson. It is, I am Phil's son, and I'm proud to be Phil's son, and I'm defined by being Phil's son. I thought that was wonderful. And, you know, you, it, it's interesting, you, you know, I suppose in another career, you know, people looked at, like an England cricket captain like Mike Brearley, they used to say, well, he's, you know, he's got a career, he's got a, a degree in people. Bobby had something similar. You know, he had a temper on him and he he could bite and certainly if he felt threatened he could have a go. Uh especially as he was in the early days of the of the nineteen ninety campaign. But he was uh, I I found him the most rounded person of the lot. And you know, when you think of what his legacy is in terms of his cancer foundation, that is a true testament to a to a fantastic man. And I'm you know, I'm I'm so uh, I'm so pleased to have known him. Um, he didn't deserve some of the stick that he took. He basically, the FA at the time were, were essentially you know, looking to move on from him. He did what any of us would do, look around and see what the other employment opportunities were and was basically you know, characterised as a traitor for doing so, which is an absolute nonsense. He also, you know, I remember him from from 86 and Mexico and, and, and you know the hand of God goal and I can I can really remember him afterwards my job that day was to be the colour writer and anyway well Bob's colour that day was puce he was absolutely raging about about the hand of God goal and um and so I felt for him really I'd love I would have loved to see him be the England manager to to win the World Cup you know, the, the and and lastly, Graham Taylor. Now you you had a relationship with Graham Taylor in the in the eighties mm -hmm. when you were with uh, with Watford, following through to to England. Was he more of a was he more of a friend? Did you have a special feeling of, of compassion toward him? How did you feel when he was being vilified by the media? It's a strange thing, Tim. Sometimes the job has to come mm -hmm. first, and. Uh, what I found was, um, you know, I, I had great respect for him and I'd seen him galvanise a club and a community in his early days at Watford. Um, very powerful figure. He was the first manager that I worked with, um, you know, in many ways. Um, and, he yeah, he just had this ability to... Um, promote a common cause for people. Um, he was tireless, but he was very, very empathetic. And uh, he gets the England job. And, well, you know, there was that infamous occasion in Rotterdam where he basically had a meltdown. And um, 
that was the moment you know so i, so I was you know i had a relationship with him uh you know i knew his wife rita his two daughters i'd seen 